All right, all right, all right. Welcome everyone to MythK, I mean Minds IRL. Those that recognize our team might be asking, why are we so far away from Milwaukee? Well, sometimes you need to learn how to fly, and why not do it in the home of the Flyers, beautiful Philadelphia. <laughs> Spoiler alert, your MC is a huge Flyers fan. This time around, we've partnered with two amazing organizations. Minds is an open source social media and social networking company that rewards users with their contributions with tokens on the Ethereum blockchain. It is a crypto social network and that upholds internet freedom. Subverse is a community-owned, decentralized news network with on-the-ground reporting, expert interviews, and pieces focused on geopolitical issues, science, and technology. Subverse does fact-based, balanced coverage of national and world issues that often go unreported. And for those of you that don't know us, a quick word about your humble host, Myth Informed. We are socio-political enthusiasts and free speech diehards. We all have full-time jobs. We do this as a labor of love and in shockingly anti-capitalist fashion, after doing this for six years, have uh, not paid ourselves a dime. Everything goes into putting on the next event. Thank you. Your attendance here is supremely appreciated. Uh, if you want to support us, we are proudly uh, on Subscribestar, so you can find us there. Uh, we have seen modest success in the YouTube podcast world, so the conversations that you see on stage, we have on our channel regularly. And over the years, we've developed a reputation for refusing to back down to keyboard warriors. We promote viewpoint diversity to limit the effects of authoritarian ideology. And as someone born in the former Soviet Union, and having been marinated in the horrors and the stories, let's take a second to talk about authoritarianism. More specifically, modern day fascistic ideas. Placing emphasis on group over the individual. Idealizing the monoculture. Viewing political violence as a means to an end. There is a reason why, last, why some a-hole called in a bomb threat to our event last year. There is a reason why our original venue was endlessly hacked and harassed. There is a reason why you only found out about this event venue location this morning. The answer is modern day fascists before whom we do not cower. The sad thing is, when radicals threaten violence and engage in harassment, it's minorities that are disproportionately affected. As a direct result of Antifa tactics, this event lost the voices of female, people of color, and gender diverse individuals, such as Blair White, Shoe on Head, Josephine, and Brittany Simon. Each cited fear of violence and harassment. How can they justify hurting the very people they claim to support it is hypocrisy at its finest. So why are we here today? To get out of our echo chambers, because mainstream and social media are incredibly divisive. They help incubate the radicals that threaten to burn down theaters. So whether you spend your days watching Ben Shapiro dunking on the libs, or watching Kyle Kalinske dunking on Ben Shapiro, <laughs> it's not healthy. This event is titled Ending Racism, Violence, and Authoritarianism. There's no mockery intended. It is not ironic or tongue-in-cheek. In fact, the only irony is threatening violence at an event meant to help decrease violence. Constructing false sin narratives will not work. I can only guess at the IQ of people calling a Jew, a Nicaraguan, a Mexican, and whatever the hell Tim is as white nationalists. <laughs> Minds, Subverse, and Myth Informed believe in this cause of promoting dialogue, exchange of ideas, and de-escalation. Events such as this are becoming rarer and rarer. Venues don't want to deal with the hassle, security costs are high, the economics are quite frankly challenging, and dealing with fascistic trolls is exhausting. So, 
Even events on the surface that seem similar end up devolving into a circle jerk by lumping like-minded speakers together. <coughs> Politicon. <laughs> so, why is the concept of differing views valuable? When we disagree, we learn to better defend our own positions or abandon those that are weak. We discuss social, political, social politics because the culture war is real, and why not bring it to life on stage? Did Gillette get you riled up by accusing men of being toxic? Has Chillic Filet put you in a tizzy because they're not cool with two dudes getting married? Well, prepare to be entertained. Now, a few logistical details. Folks, we are from Wisconsin, so first and foremost, the bar is over yonder through that door. <laughs> and, thank you. And in direct order of importance, bathrooms are over that way. And also, I highly encourage everyone, if you didn't see it on your way in, to visit the debate station, which is literally right out there. It is backed by popular demand. It is amazing. We have a great moderator. And as last year, most likely speakers will be coming out and popping into random debates. So please go out there, sit down in the chair, and uh, test your mettle. Schedule of events is posted on the website. It is also on your handouts. Note there is one food break from 2.40 to 3.20. And please keep your hands stamped at all times. Those that have wristbands and lanyards, please keep them on at all times. Do not lose them. I can't stress that enough. Uh, with all the shenanigans going on these days, uh, you're kind of SOL if you do. And now regarding photography, it's cool by all means. Just don't flash people in the face repeatedly. Um, if you get approached by a large Nicaraguan, you know you've stepped over the line. So that's your litmus test. Um, for Q&As, let's keep our comments short. Uh, the line is going to be over there. When you see me entering the hall, you know that it's Q&A time. Um, and if you haven't already, please make sure you download the Minds app. Um, if you use hashtag MindsIRL, that's all one word. Um, we're going to be reading questions from there intermittently, so in lieu of karate chopping people on your way to get into the line, you can just submit your question there, and if it's entertaining, I'll probably read it. Two quick shout-outs. One, first and foremost, to the Pittman police for their service and dedication to keeping peace at the after-party location. So thanks to them. And then secondly, and most likely a bigger applause, will be to the, an enormous shout out to our after party location. The human village has had to deal with an insane amount of harassment. They deserve mad respect for not backing down. Um, there have people been giving them one star reviews on Yelp uh, for ridiculous reasons. So if you do use Yelp, I don't know who does these days. I wouldn't. Um, give them five stars. Um, we realized that those after-party tickets, I'm sorry, I didn't leave room for applause. Let's applaud the human village. So uh, we realized those tickets were limited um, because of space limitations, so if you weren't able to snag them, um, the Sugar House Casino has promised to not close their doors tonight. So obviously, please feel free to stay here. Um, and whether staying here or going to the human village, uh, all of these folks have been incredibly understanding, so let's consider repaying them with our graciousness and generosity. And now, for our lineup today, which I'm late on, it is incredible and unrepeatable. I'm still gonna make this joke, uh, even though it's not true. Tim Pool wanted to be here to kick off his own event, but I'm told he had YouTube videos to record, <laughs> which is incredible dedication to the craft. He is here, though. You might think we're starting with something a little more light, talking about, I don't know, how egregious microtransactions are in gaming these days, uh, which is true. Uh, but we're not. Uh, we're going full throttle right from the beginning. Our topic is the Great Migration, a discussion on digital and physical migration. And who better to kick off moderation duties than a foreigner? Ladies and gentlemen, let's warmly welcome the distinguished Stephen Knight, blogger and host of the award-winning Godless Spellchecker podcast. Stephen is highly polished, you'll see when he comes out, and injects a witty, biting humor into his moderation style. Plus, he is the most proper of Englishmen, so let's please welcome to the stage the poor man's Benedict Cumberbatch. Welcome, Stephen! Got it. 
And first up on stage is going to be the extravagant Lauren Chen, sometimes better known as Roaming Millennial. As a socio-political commentator and host of both the CRTV show Roaming Millennial Uncensored and the new Blaze TV show Pseudo Intellectual, Lauren Starr is rising rapidly. The past three years, she's been a YouTube sensation with over 20 million views and staying busy with appearances on Fox News, Daily Wire, Rebel Media, PragerU, and The Rubin Report. Lauren is most fat. <laughs> that was probably Steve. Most passionate about individual liberty, gender equality, and issues surrounding rates. So let's give it up for Lauren. Next up is another foreigner from far off New Zealand. Michael Rollins, AKA Music Man Mike, is a mean guitar player, music aficionado, and songwriter. At last year's MythCon, he had us introduce him as a radically left, culturally Marxist, SJW YouTube personality. And this year, he softened that label, and he is a progressive with opinions on socio-cultural politics. Welcome, Mike. So we seem to be on a roll with folks from Oceania, so let's next welcome to the stage a YouTuber and cultural political commentator based in Brisbane, Australia. Daisy Cousins is a regular television commentator on Sky News and contributor to publications like The Spectator Australia and The Courier Mail. She definitely considers herself, herself to be on the front lines of the culture war, so let's welcome to the stage Daisy Cousins. Steven. <laughs> and rounding out our panel is a New York City-based comedian, writer, progressive commentator, podcaster, and founder of the unapologetically liberal website RepublicanDirtyTricks.com, now known as RDT Daily. De Tara Devlin is no stranger to speaking her mind, having opened for Judy Gold, Kate Clinton, and Jessica Kirsten while appearing on numerous nationally syndicated liberal talk shows. Let's give it up for Tara! I'm sure you're all aware that there was a group of people who were really committed to the idea of preventing this yeah. event from happening. So you're, you're all testament to the fact that there were a bunch of utter failures, essentially. So thank you for being here. Um, it's a great panel for the first one. We're going to be talking about the Great Migration, a discussion on digital and physical immigration. And um, Daisy, I think I'll start with you. Uh, in a culture we have now on social media, uh, and where people are being deplatformed, sometimes it, it almost seems like it's due to political bias. Do we need a sort of digital bill of rights to protect us from these big companies who are deciding who can uh, be online and who can't? Yeah, I, I think we definitely do. Um, but it's not just about the sort of deplatforming and potential political bias going on in companies like Facebook and, and Google. It's about privacy. Um, I don't think the, your average person realizes just how efficiently big corporations are tracking our mm -hmm. every move from you know, where we live, where we work, who we're talking to, all a private information, all of that gets tracked. And really what it's the equivalent to is walking around with like a squadron of, of like spy drones following you everywhere. And when you think of it like that, it, it should scare us. Like it's, it's quite scary. But I think the reason it doesn't is because one, it's invisible. And two, it's associated with products that we like, like Facebook and like online shopping. So it's this sort of positive um, stimulation coupled with, with effectively we're being spied on. So um, again, the devil would be in the detail because if you regulate it too much, then we just won't have a functioning internet and companies won't be able to do anything. But a few basic tenets like the ability to opt out of being tracked, you know, companies need to be more transparent with that kind of thing, obviously more transparency with social media deplatforming, what they actually might mean by their very vague terms and conditions, um, you know, maybe 
companies need permission if a third party wants to transfer your data, um, all of that kind of stuff. But I think in this brave new digital age with the, the internet, which is evolving and evolving and evolving faster than we can imagine, um, we do need um, a different set of rules. Mm -hmm. Lauren, you're somebody who doesn't shy away from tackling sort of politically diverse topics on your channel. And how, how would you, what's your viewpoint on the idea of some legislation that would give you as a content creator more protection from the companies that own YouTube and Twitter and various other platforms? Well, as someone who's hopefully Mike is on, yes it is. Um, <laughs> I'm generally not a big proponent of, yes, let's have more government, more rules and all of this. But I find when we look at the online sphere, we see an area where consumer protections have really lagged behind every single other industry, right? It's not okay for a restaurant to just serve you rotten food, but for some reason, that reason being I think a lot of lobbying, these tech companies have gotten away with pretty much anything under the sun, and it's only now that we're starting to be concerned about it when we're finding out about things like, oh, you know, the the Hey Alexa or Siri or whatever those comments that you make to your devices, it actually turns out that's being sent to real people. Um, now, finally, people are more aware of what's been going on, I think, for a long time. So, I mean, an Internet Bill of Rights, that sounds very, I mean, it sounds like it's this new thing, this thing we've never encountered before, a whole different maybe constitution. But really, I think what a lot of people want is just the same consumer protections they've had in every other industry applied to the tech industry and online sphere. Michael, um, you're somebody with uh, a hat. Uh, what's all that about? <laughs> well, uh, some of the more astute amongst you might have noticed uh, it's not actually a MAGA hat. Um, you'll find that it actually says, make skeptics great again. Thanks, Mum. Um, uh, because uh, I believe, as a skeptic myself, that the, the name skeptic has been tarnished by dickheads like Sargon. Um, <laughs> don't worry, we had beers last night, we talked about it. <laughs> um, yeah, no, just a bit of tongue-in-cheek, eh? Okay. Yep. And, uh, so I would like to say that I agree with Daisy and uh, Lauren, capitalism sucks ass. <laughs> yeah! And then, Thanks, other mum. So, Tari, Tari, you're applauding, applauding that now, so how, how do you feel about these big conglomerates that control the political discourse? I. I'm not happy about it. I feel that it's a necessary evil, though. That's how I feel about Facebook, because we, we have to we stream on Facebook, we stream on YouTube. There's so many rules. I have been put in the doghouse before where they block you. And there's nothing, you know, for a certain period of time, they put you on a hold hmm. where you can't do anything. And you don't know why sometimes. There's, no, there's nothing you can do about it. You can't speak to a real person. You, you're just stuck. And that's the whole thing with, with corporations owning our discourse. We, there, at least if there is some kind of regulation on social media, on these big companies, we, the people, can go and have, we would have a say. We would have a say if we went to our representative mm -hmm. and we could lobby them. Do you know what I mean? Instead, of, there's no way you can go into the Facebook offices and and express your disapproval of what's of their censorship policies that can that, that constantly change as well. And, and it's arbitrary. To, to the headquarters doesn't work either. <laughs> Say that again. What? I said handcuffing yourself to the headquarters doesn't work. No, either. exactly. So it's they. That's why we form government <clears throat> anyway. It's to so we get together as a community and we tell the corporations that this is how we want you to behave and treat us. And especially if it's such a, it's a platform that is essential for democracy. This is, this is uh, the new, you know, this is the, the, all these platforms, this is the new reality we live in. Okay, that's a, that's a great point. So Daisy, I'd like you to follow up on that. So the, Tara just mentioned the idea that these platforms are essential. And it seems to me that you can fast become a non-person in the public sphere right. if you're prevented from using these tools. If you want to be an activist or a content creator, if Twitter decides to ban you, or you're solely non grata, you, you disappear out of people's consciousness. So how much of an effect is that having on political discourse, do you think? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting point. I mean, platform access, if you're any kind of um, commentator, is, is so com completely essential to the profession. And certainly we see people like, Laura Luma, whether you agree with her or disagree with her, she's a voice and she's, she's disappeared like off the face of the planet now. You, you can't find her anywhere except on sites like Telegram and there just aren't enough people on sites like Telegram um, or Gab to actually create the sort of commentary circle that you want. So um, 
it, it really, really does have an effect, and it is a shame because it's, it's bad for democracy. Aside from anything else, if you're banning certain voices, um, even if those voices are saying things you don't particularly like, well, you're preventing people from seeking the information and potentially disagreeing with those voices and thinking, hey, I actually don't like that. You've possibly changed my opinion unintentionally. Um, so that's, a, that's another reason um, to have a digital bill of rights, because not only can you lose your platform, you'll also lose your livelihood. I mean, people mm -hmm. um, rely on the internet, not just commentators, but everyone to advertise businesses, for instance, or to advertise products or to sell things. And if, if, if Facebook decides in all its omnipotent glory, ah, oh, no, no, well, you can't be on a platform anymore, well, th there goes your income. And, you know, I mean, I, I love your comment about uh, capitalism, myself and Laura, but just, you know, <laughs> I, might, I may be a capitalist, but I'm not a corporatist. Mm -hmm. You know, I believe in, I believe in freedom. <laughs> freedom first and foremost, and I can acknowledge, again, I believe in the free market and free enterprise, but big corporations have more power over people's lives and freedoms than most governments mm -hmm. nowadays, and particularly big tech. Mike, did you want to follow up on that? I was gonna, well, at first I was just going to say I don't really think that democracy is losing anything by not hearing from Laura Luma, so, mm -hmm. um, <coughs> um, and, and second of all, um, I don't know, the, this, um, the idea of, I mean, I, I agree that, that um, these big companies having uh, so much control over uh, stuff is not a good thing. I mean, that's kind of what being on the left is all about. But um, uh, the idea of like deplatforming um, from uh, from a social media platform. I mean, first of all, uh, you know, it's happened to me as well. We were just saying about you know, I've I've been banned off Twitter. I've had videos deleted from uh, um, from YouTube. Not because there was anything wrong with them, but because a lot of people decided that they didn't like me and, and you know, no, no, no. flag my videos and, yes. and so they get deleted, right? Um, but I don't see that as, I don't see that as like censorship or, or deplatforming or whatever. I mean, sure, you're, you're taken off that platform, but you know, there's always another baker, if, if I'm honest. You know, I, you can always go somewhere else and talk and even if you're taken off all of the platforms, you can still go outside and spread your nonsense on the corner if you mm -hmm. want to. You know, no one's stopping you from doing that. <laughs> government censorship is a bad right. thing. And right. so if the government's coming in and saying, or putting you in jail, I suppose, for, for saying what you're saying, obviously that's a bad thing. But if you go on Facebook and say, uh, yeah, N-word, fucking, right. you know, stupid brown people, you know, and then- <laughs> Gotta do something like, with my Tuesday nights, Mike. What's that? Gotta do something with my Tuesday nights. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> But then, if you you know the, the 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 company has rules, and sure, maybe they're uh, maybe they're a bit ambiguous or whatever. But there are they do have rules, and okay. if you break those, and you get thrown off, that's kind of the consequences of your action, right? Lauren, follow, following up on Mike's just said, then can we just go elsewhere? Is it really that big of a deal if Twitter says no? Are these various other platforms we can be heard on? Is it we're really over overblowing this um, issue? Well, that's a big issue with a lot of the um, arguments that are being made in favor of like, oh, this is censorship, this isn't, right? Because I mean, yeah, it's true, censorship really only applies in the legal sense to the government, but what we see when it comes to social media platforms is it's not always as simple as, oh, just find another baker, right? We see that with, I mean, Twitter has a huge monopoly uh, on the social media scene, and even when we see competitors try to come in and get a, I guess, different segment of the market, we see them being attacked by the media as being, you know, Nazi platforms, and in, in Cases like Subscribestar, which tries to pre present an alternative to something like Patreon, we see that payment processors refuse to work with them, and some are saying there's maybe even collusion between other social media platforms and things like uh, places like PayPal, Mastercard, and things in order to prevent competition from entering into the market. I'm like Daisy. I love free markets. I don't like corporatism. Um, one of the things that I think hasn't gotten enough attention uh, are the fact that these big tech companies are monopolies. Um, there are already laws on the books to prevent monopolies from forming. They're called antitrust laws. And a lot of people will say, well, hang on, it's not a mon monopoly. Like, Gab exists, you can start Gab. That's not how monopolies are defined in the legal sense. It's not whether or not it's possible to technically have a site where people can post comments and, oh, look, it's a competitor to Facebook. No, no. It's determined by market share. Right now, places like Facebook, uh, Twitter, Instagram being part of Facebook, and YouTube, they have overwhelming 
control of the market, especially if you look at Google, just as an advertiser, as a search engine, it is unreal how much power Google has amassed. And Daisy's right, like these mm -hmm. corporations have more control of us than uh, in a lot of ways our governments. They can control what we say, they can control who we send money to. In Laura Loomer's case, they can even control whether we have a bank account and are able to pay our bills. It's, it's insane and I think, you know, I'm, I consider myself in favor of small government because I want personal liberty, right? So to me, it doesn't matter if it's the government or Google who's infringing on my rights, it's not okay in either case. How are we gonna, how are we gonna um, uh, fix the problem with Break the them corporate? Up. Yes, but how, who's up. gonna do that? If we're right. we're well, the, there's, a, there's a federal trade commission that's specifically, their whole purview is to monitor things like this. So, I mean, when mergers happen, like for example, Disney recently acquired Fox, a lot of people weren't sure whether that was going to be approved. Um, I'm shocked that nothing has been done yet, but actually I think the latest news is the FTC is going to be investigating places like Google, and I absolutely do believe they should be broken up. Cool. Okay. Well, so, Tara, moving on a little bit from digital um, immigration and the problems we have with these monopolies, uh, immigration, physical immigration in general, is always a massively uh, big political issue. It always seems to dominate every election cycle. It's something the public deeply care about. And, and my question is, what kind of rules can we enforce on people immigrating to other countries that are fair? What kind of things, if any, should we ask of people coming and trying to say, you know, start a new life in the country that you live in? What kind of rules can we tell So, them? for instance, should we um, demand that these people have a respect for freedom of expression, gender well, equality? Is that a fair assessment to make to somebody who wants to travel to a different country? I would honestly, the yeah, I would think that. And well, what 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 uh, <coughs> you guys were saying about the monopolies? We have these antitrust laws on the books, but if we don't have representatives who are eager and willing to enforce them, then that this is what we have. They turn a blind eye to the immense power, the immense corporate power, and they're not going to break it up because the, the root of the issue is money and politics. That's the root of all evil. And they're, they're not gonna, uh, you know, uh, they're really not working for us. They're working for their, their you know, their, they wanna keep their positions and they're working for the, the corporations that now run government. Anyway, so as far as uh, putting rules on people who come in, I would assume and, help and hope that people who come to America, is, if this is what we're talking about specifically, have a respect for democracy and freedom and you know what what is freedom though everybody it's such a such a uh, a broad word i think that uh, somebody <laughs> is who can't go to a doctor when sick that's not free you're not free you know you if you don't have a living wage if you can't retire you're not free and uh, as, and so that's i believe that this this country um, you know we do have uh, the grand experiment in liberal democracy is is on the ropes right now because of uh, and I, it's not because of immigration it's because of the fact that we have representatives now that are in bed with corporate power <laughs> okay um daisy you're as a representative of australia here today <laughs> um, of all australia um, your immigration uh, system is something that's coveted in my home country quite a lot. It's of, often thrown up as an example of where we'd like to go with immigration. It's held up to this high standard. So maybe you could talk a little bit about what is expected of people coming to settle in Australia and what, if anything else, you would like to add or, subtra or subtract to that system already. Cool. Um, Australia has some of the strictest immigration laws in the world. But having said that, there are a lot of ways to get into Australia legally. There are a lot of different visa types for skilled workers and unskilled workers and, and students. And we have sort of a point-based, a merit-based immigration system as well. Um, we have a legal refugee <coughs> intake every year. Um, there are a lot of ways to get in, but you have to get in legally. We have a very, very strict policy. Again, we follow the zero tolerance policy against illegal immigration. And um, most of our, or really all of our illegal immigrants try to come by boat. You know, they say, we don't need a wall because we have a moat. <laughs> we're, we're an island. Um, and what happened, we learned a harsh lesson about our borders in Australia about 10 years ago when um, the Labor government opened the borders and said, right, all, all the boats from Indonesia, places like that can come across. What happened was we had to open an extra 19 detention centers 
on islands out of the coast of Australia. We had 50,000 people tramped into those detention centers. Um, 8,000 of those were children, and 1,200 people drowned at sea trying to get over because they started up the people <coughs> smuggling trade. So you had people in other countries lying to people and saying, oh, look, it's straight to Australia, it'll be fine, just give us ten, give us $10,000, we can come on this rickety boat, possibly drown, but you'll get there and it'll be cool. Um, so we learned from that, and when the next government came in, they instigated what they call Operation Sovereign Borders. So if you try to come to Australia by boat, illegally, you will not get in. That's just the message that we put out there. You, the best you can hope for is um, a temporary protection visa, which lasts for about up to three years, for instance, and that entitles you to Medicare, that entitles you to government benefits, you're very well taken care of, but there's no path to citizenship. And because of our stance on borders and, and immigration, we have one of, if not the most successful multicultural societies in the world. We have very low crime, we have very few problems with ethnic enclaves, um, people integrate. Um, migrants on various visas, including our refugees, get access to 510 hours of English language classes, for instance, to help them to integrate. Um, and it, it works for us. And yes, I think our detention center situation can be improved, definitely. There's always room for improvement. Um, but yeah, that's why I guess it's the UK, and I think you know, there's been mentions in the US that the Australian immigration system is optimal. We we do it very well. Mm. Mike, uh, big, big fan of the Australian immigration system. Honestly, I don't know why anyone would want to move to Australia. <laughs> <laughs> Can't even think of it. I just, I, I um, you know, uh, actually, we, uh, um, New Zealanders um, like to move to Australia a lot. I just looked it up. It said that in 2003, you got 650,000 New Zealanders. So there's obviously something wrong with New Zealand. <laughs> I like New Zealanders. They can come to Australia. Yeah, yeah, they all tend to fucking... No, not the there. Indonesians, though. I'm just <laughs> kidding. I <laughs> thought... <laughs> 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 yeah, um, yeah. Should we have any expectations on people trying to immigrate to other countries? I mean, like, skill yeah, sets, I there are. Uh, but, you know, I mean, if you're a... You know, I honestly, I don't really know what the... The only thing I know about New Zealand immigration is that you can come to New Zealand... Uh, you can get a one-year work and holiday visa, you can stay for a year, and then you can kind of apply for citizenship. But I do know that it is, it is pretty damn hard. I had a friend who, um, who had a, a, a girlfriend from Czech, and she came, and like, you have to have a, like a full-time job, and you know, have to have certain uh, you know, income and all that sort of stuff. And it makes it really difficult for you know, just your average person mm -hmm. to right. immigrate to the country. And I, I, I don't know, I think that's kind of dumb. I, is, um, isn't it the issue that some people don't want the average person coming to their country? They'd rather have people that would contribute in a way that would improve the country. Is that a fair? I mean, I've, I'm concern? of the opinion that, that most people can contribute pretty nicely. You know, mm -hmm. give people a chance. You know, I'm a, I, I like people. People are good, and you know, I, uh, a lot of people uh, do that. What's that? Nothing. There we go. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, fucking hippies. Give people a uh, chance. No, no, I agree. I, I totally agree. I mean, you know, I mean, maybe I'm a, maybe, you know, I, but I like to, I like to um, give people the benefit, the, the benefit of the doubt most of the time. That's why I hung out with Sargon last night. You know, um, <laughs> they were getting on like a married couple. I have to say, <laughs> just, just so you know. Um, Lauren, you you focus you focus a lot. I wasn't dumb, but whatever. <laughs> you focus a lot on US politics, and, and of late we've seen um, ICE detention centres described by quite senior public officials as concentration camps, oh, yeah. and that's had a, uh, an, an impact on the, the discourse and various actions, I would say, that have taken place, but, you know, terrorist acts. Uh, so is that kind of rhetoric, I mean, would you describe that as a fair um, summation of the situation, uh, and if not, what sort of effect does that kind of rhetoric have on people? Well, I think, um, you know, Tim Poole, who's obviously part of planning this event, did a video about it where it's like he actually goes into the definitions and things of concentration camps. And in the technical definition, usually when it comes to something like a detention center uh, for migrants or even, I think, POWs in some certain cases, like uh, concentration camps is not the vernacular that's used. And when we're just talking about casual language, the average average person, I think there's a very specific reason why that term is used, and it's to conjure up images of the Holocaust, yeah. right? Um, anyone who says, oh, what? You you think we're trying to compare that to not what? No, yeah, that's, I think that's why it's done. And, um, I, I think that that is an unfair comparison, but that being said, that doesn't mean we have to be happy about what's happening in the detention centers, right? I actually think uh, the number of people who are being kept there, and I think a lot of them 
uh, like Daisy alluded to previously, are being told lies about what's going to happen when you come to the border. So uh, the United States and actually Canada, to a large extent, we're in a tough situation where we have all of these people coming in um, under the assumption that they'll just be able to get in. And obviously, you know, we have checks. We have to do ideally a background check. You, you can't just show up and expect to be a, a resident with all of the privileges that that implies. So what do we do with these people? Like that's actually a very, very hard thing to solve. Like, do we just let them in, but we don't know who they are? Like, do we send them back? What if they don't have anywhere to go back to? That's why these detention centers exist. And it's a very, very terrible situation for everybody involved, for the people who have to be in them, for the Americans and the Canadians and all the taxpayers who are paying to fund this. No one's happy about this. And I think the detention centers are actually a symptom of a larger problem, which is we have to look at, and the Trump administration is doing this in Canada. There's a federal election that's going to be coming up. We're going to be looking at our increasingly large immigration problem as well to address the issue. I think people, they, they, they need to know that you can't just show up into the country and expect to be let in. Um, you know, if, if you are a, a, an asylum seeker, there's an official process that you need to follow. You have to come in through a legal port of entry. And I mean, for, for anyone else who may just be hoping to come in but doesn't meet uh, asylum, I guess, criteria, you can apply from an embassy and you know be able to live your life in, in your own country with your family without being in that detention center. So, I mean, I'm with everybody who's complaining about detention centers. They're not a good thing, uh, but at the same time, we can agree it's not a good thing without saying that we're reenacting the Holocaust. Okay, so just before I throw to Tara, just a um, okay. quick throwback to Mike about when I, when I mentioned concentration camps and you affirmed that you think that descriptors accurate. Now, just in light of what Lawrence just said, do you use that in, a, in the semantic, it technically is a concentration camp? Are you, are you, are you alluding to sort of Auschwitz? And I, would, I think of arguing the semantics of a place where we're concentrating mm -hmm. people and, and putting them in detention and then like not supplying them basic human mm -hmm. rights like toilet paper and beds and heat is, I've, if we're going to argue the semantics about that, I don't care. And obviously, I mean, Lauren said that she's not cool with either. That's fine with me. Um, I think the thing that needs to be done is to look at the reasons why people are coming to America. I um, mean, you can say, okay, we need to look at our immigration policy or whatever, but I mean, what about like American foreign policy in, the, in South America? Climate change is a big thing, which is going to be uh, increasingly getting worse and driving people out of places. And, and you know, the, the, there's a lot of things that can be done. But currently, the Trump administration doesn't give a fuck about climate change. Um, they, uh, you know, aren't acknowledging anything to do with their terrible foreign policy as well. So, I mean, right. if you want to talk about things that are causing this, immigra the, this yeah. immigration crisis, yeah. uh, the border crisis, you know, uh, it's, uh, we're looking in the wrong place. Right. Okay. Tara, anything yeah. to add to that? Yeah, I just, no one wakes up in the morning and says, I'm going to take a 2,000 mile walk across <laughs> the desert with my child. Yeah. You know, for the hell of it, because I want to clean somebody's toilet here in the United States or get some great benefit. What kind of social? We don't even have the greatest social safety net in this country, and there's many restrictions, including for people who aren't citizens to get. And that was the that's Bill Clinton's uh, ending welfare as we know it. He changed that, so it's just a canard that people are coming here to, to have some kind of cushy whatever. But the fact is, there's push factors and pull factors that that make people want to take that journey. And the many of the people that uh, that that the, and, and throughout history, we have we, we have the statistics. The United States has accepted you know in its history more immigrants than any other country on earth. This uh, that is our our foundation because we are, uh, our original uh, founders were immigrants themselves. They came here and they displaced the indigenous people. So, the, the, in fact, one of the charges against the king was he was limiting immigration to the United States. So, in the Declaration of Independence. Sorry about that. <laughs> but that was I one feel of terrible, the, I feel terrible. I hear you, but that's so, but in, even still, we have struggled because we are human beings with the, the tribal mentality of these people are coming. You can look throughout history in general, no matter what happens, it's, it's people, new, newcomers are going to, you have the same rhetoric about the newcomer, that they're, they're bringing disease, they're bringing crime, they're rapists. Some of them, I suppose, are good people, I guess, right? 
But uh, on both sides, <laughs> both, both sides, both sides. Yeah, Very yeah. fine people on both sides. So since we're on Trump, Daisy, we seem, we're in the great US of A today. I thought I'd ask we you are. about his. Um, <laughs> glad you with us, Mike. I was pretty drunk last night. <laughs> <laughs> spooning Sargon, basically. <laughs> um, so I am feeling assaulted. <laughs> So Daisy, so um, Trump's executive order, which was more popularly known as the Muslim ban, uh, which limited immigration from various majority Muslim countries, uh, brought into the debate this idea of whether or not we could impose a religious test on people traveling to different countries. Do you think that's a fair uh, thing to advocate for, for people coming into your country to decide what sort of ideologies they have or religions they have? Um, I think that countries should be allowed to let whoever they want into their country and decide who they don't want to come in. Now, if you were going to ban a particular religion from coming into a country, like the government would have to have a pretty damn good reason to do it because if you're randomly doing that on an international scale um, for just sort of no seeming reason, well, that would look terrible um, internationally and there might be repercussions of people not wanting to agree with you, etc. But also within the country, if you're banning a religion with no great demand from it from the public, well, they'll just punish you with a ballot box. So it's not something that countries can just kind of do and, and throw around. They'd, they'd have to have a very, very good reason to do it. And um, if you're talking about, say, um, a values test, for instance, coming into a country, Australia actually threw this idea up very recently of um, on our citizenship test also including um, values questions. Just to, again, to, we were um, noting a slightly rising problem with ethnic enclaves in the western suburbs of Sydney that were largely Muslim. And we pride ourselves on not having that in Australia. So some of the core things they said we could ask was say, uh, do you believe in freedom of speech? And you know, equality of the sexes, the rule of law and, and democracy and just very, very stock standard values that are um, typical of a, of a Western liberal democracy. Um, and there was a lot of um, howling down of that by sort of oppositional people on the far left because apparently asking people whether they believe in freedom of speech is somehow racist. I don't know. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think that I believe in national sovereignty. I think that a, con a country's first and foremost responsibility, I knew that would have <laughs> has to be to its, own, to its own citizen. So yeah, it gives countries power to do that, but they, they really do have to have a damn good reason to do it. Okay. So Lauren, national populism is... <laughs> is um, is this, an, this is a Nazi salute. Somebody get a, somebody get a quick wow. screenshot here. I'm just going to quickly throw to Lauren. Right. Um, so this idea of a religious <laughs> test, is this a fair way to look at immigrants? A, a national populism seems to be a big thing at the moment. Is it right for a country to say, you know, we're a Christian nation, we will prioritise Christians, and, you know, Muslim nations do the same thing but the other way around? Um, so, like Daisy, I totally believe that a country has its first obligation to its own citizens. I believe that any immigration policy should be done with the native population in mind. That doesn't mean it's necessarily anti-immigrant though, right? Because I do believe that in certain cases, there can be benefits from immigration, especially when it's high skilled. In terms of a, any sort of values test, I'm against saying, are you a Muslim? N yeah, okay, then you can't come. Because I mean, obviously there are a lot of great, very well-educated, um, wonderful Muslims out there that I think Canada has benefited from having. However, we can't overlook the fact that there are, um, you know, a, a, especially among certain religions, um, increases of things like, I mean, we've had honor killings in Canada. We've had communities who have attempted to go to our Supreme Court and say, we don't want to live under Canadian law, we want to live under our religious law. Those are obviously problems. And I think a values test can, in a very basic way, uh, weed out people who don't want to assimilate to you know, Australian life, American life, Canadian life, without simply saying, you know, no this or this or this. And you know, as if you are a Christian nation, for example, I, I think it's very fair to say um, for, for example, like refugees to prioritize people who are not only being um, persecuted overseas, uh, but also perhaps maybe have some more similar values too. Does that say like, oh, Christian is plus five points, Scientologist minus 27? Yeah. Sounds fair, not. sounds fair. <laughs> maybe for Scientologists, the only one that people would get on board with. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think there should be at least some sort of discussion uh, about the belief systems that we are importing, because don't forget, all of our countries were democracies. So this isn't just about 
I don't want to live next to someone who doesn't believe the same things I do. It's, I mean, eventually these could be significant blo voting blocks in your own country, and I certainly wouldn't want to, you know, in 15 or 20 years, see an initiative to, for example, I don't know, disenfranchise women or something like that, make homosexuality illegal because we weren't having this conversation. Okay, I think I best throw to Mike before he hurts himself. Right. Yeah, okay, so this idea that, um, that, that Muslims are inherently worse... Uh, no one said that. No, 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 no I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying, I'm not saying that you did. I'm just saying there is, uh, um, in the ethos... Okay, so I'm, I, I was reading an article about uh, like the 2016 after the um, the Pulse nightclub shooting, and there is a certain uh, political leaning that uh, that has a talking point that Muslim people are uh, they, they their beliefs are like anti LGBT. That's <laughs> like <laughs> it is. Um, so, uh, but I mean, the, fa the fact is, we have polling data that shows that uh, Muslim uh, people in America are more uh, accepting of gay people than Christian Americans. So the I, I think isn't that, I think that was against evangelicals, so very strict. No, it's, it's, I've Christian. got the thing right here. Here it is. Uh, Muslims, 52% agree that being gay is okay. And then you've got, uh, where are we? Um, Catholics, Protestants, 52%. White evangelicals, uh, 34%. You know, so I mean, the idea that, that, that Muslim, the Muslim religion is necessarily anti-LGBT, uh, anti I think, is, is not correct. And the, I mean, the, the, thing, the other thing that shows is that over time, um, the, the approval of, of uh, being gay or being LGBT has, has, uh, rises amongst the, the, the Muslim community. That being, on the other hand, we're talking about friggin' America for itself. I mean, people, people, just look at the Trump administration, like, Super anti-LGBT. I mean, if you what? could. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Oh. LGBT uh, trans ban on the on the military. Really? Jeez. I mean, like. <laughs> you must not read the news. Okay, okay. So, so, so save, oh, it, save it for the yeah. Q and A. There'll be a microphone, and you can all you can all have at it in a moment. I mean, sorry, but like, but like. Are you? Okay. What an amazing time to start Q and A. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, you're a rock star. I love you. Okay. Um, there's a mic over yonder, if folks want. Also, the questions that are being submitted are awesome. They're very tech-based, so I'm pretty sure I'm going to leave them for Bill Ottman to answer. <laughs> hey, guys. Earlier, uh, you were talking about social media being a monopoly, and it got me to thinking... With social media, our information is the product, and the corporations receiving that are the buyers. And there are plenty of companies that do that. So are we using an old term for a similar problem? And is that unhelpful in some way? Is that addressed to anyone in particular, or are you just throwing it to the group? Just throwing it up. Well, I think, no, Lauren, I think you're probably best off addressing this one. Um, you mentioned monopolies sorry, earlier. So social media or is who is the client versus the customer? Well, as far as I'm aware, Monopoly is a company that sort of has a market corner on a certain product. And tons of people sell information to corporations, which is what social media is a product. So when we're calling that a monopoly, it's not really a monopoly. Other people do want to purchase it. It's something different. It's the use of the terminology. Well, I think regardless of whether you're looking as the, the client, as the, the user, or the advertiser, or the person buying the data, because I think there's an argument to be made w both ways. In both cases, there actually is still a monopoly, because if you look at, for example, the, the companies that have the largest trove information, the largest access to this information, it's still those same companies, right? It's still Alphabet through Google and YouTube, and it's still very much Facebook, as we've seen. I mean, in, and I, I actually like that approach because it gives us more reasons to clamp down on them because they have several monopolies. It's also a terrible game. <laughs> Ruined family. <laughs> okay. Um, I've noticed... Okay, sorry. I've noticed as a culture, the majority of people are pro-freedom, pro-free speech, However, I've noticed th throughout history, the people who are pro-free speech, once they gain power, they tend to uh, ensure that like the, the uh, faction that was not pro
pro-free speech that was once the hegemony uh, tends to, like they tend to suppress the people who were in power previously. How do we as a society and a culture uh, prevent ourselves from, I don't know, becoming authority? Oh, <laughs> yike. Just like that. <laughs> right? You sir have been sentenced. <laughs> How do we prevent ourselves from becoming the authoritarians that we have already? Uh, anyone want to pick up on that, the idea of absolute power corrupting? Um, I think that we do that by having a complete uh, understanding of what it means to live in a democracy. We need to be educated and understand that democracies fail, that we, uh, I believe that, uh, that's why I believe in public education and how we, we, you need to teach children that this is, a, this is something that needs to be cultivated and protected. So it has to be in the, in the public zeitgeist, in the consciousness. I have a bit of a different opinion um, as to how do we present, prevent ourselves from becoming authoritarians. I actually say that we don't rely too much on democracy because your whole question was how do we prevent uh, you know, the people who now come in power who were previously pro-free speech from then suppressing the minority. Um, I don't think, I, I mean, Michael Malice, who I had on my show, he said it great, um, my rights aren't up for discussion, much less a vote. So I very much believe in the idea of a constitutional republic where some things are not up for um, So when it comes to a digital or internet bill of rights, what would be the punishment for breaking these rules since many of the businesses see these fines currently as just a business expense and they essentially make more money off of breaking the rules anyway? How do we go about um, punishing them for doing so without becoming the full socialist or authoritarians essentially controlling um, these companies? Daisy, do you want to grab that? Look, that's, that's a really, really good point actually that you raise because it, it is all very well as you know we're talking about the digital bill of rights and you know making sure third parties have consent before they sh um, share your information but you're absolutely <coughs> right how do you actually enforce those rules and those rights particularly on a global scale and particularly since these country these companies are so big and so rich that they can just bob up any kind of fine um, as a business expense I mean as to how we enforce that look I'm actually not sure yet, and that's, and that's what's so kind of scary about the way the internet is growing and it keeps on evolving. We're going to have to keep on inventing more and more and more um, sets of rules as we go. I mean, as Lauren was saying, breaking them up um, is an option, you know, making them just a little bit smaller so the fines, for instance, will have more of a consequence to them. Thinking of, I mean, you can talk about blocking them from, from, I guess, trading with people, but then that would be bad because that would affect people's incomes and there could be loss of jobs. So it is, it's, it's extremely complicated. And thank you for raising that point because it is very important to consider how we actually tackle this problem. Like we've created a real sticky situation for ourselves here with the internet and we need to somehow talk about this, ask these questions and, and somehow solve it. I wish I had a better answer. <laughs> it's complicated. <laughs> Gulag, yeah, I'm sure. Speaking of the internet, we have an amazing question from Minds, uh, from Psychedelic Gazelle, whoever you are. People are good, is good in theory, regarding immigration. But how should people like LGBT folks, ex-Muslims, etc., feel when a significant number of people immigrating from Muslim countries want us dead? say that a significant amount of people immigrating from Muslim countries want us dead? Do we have a specific... Well, just to play devil's advocate for the UK, where popular polling data suggests that 0% of Muslims polled think that LGBT right, uh, sorry, gay uh, right, the, being gay is acceptable, sorry, and 52% would say that it should be illegal. So, uh, so that, okay. for anyone who's LGBT, that's a very concerning that's statistic. Fine. I mean, I'm not into religion, period. I mean, I practice Buddhism because I don't like Catholicism. I was raised, my mother was a nun, for Christ's sake, so, you know, I, I, was, I went to Catholic school, and I understand, you know, yes, she was a nun, an ex-nun, yeah, and my father was a garbage man, so, you know, what are you going to do? So, but anyway, I, right now, I mean, as we're talking about freedom, and will they come here and bring, and bring their 
their ideology, what if they don't want to conform? Well, you know, when, when the Supreme Court of the United States says that marriage equality is now the law of the land, and then you have a specific, uh, like, like Kim Davis, for, for example, saying it's her religious right not to follow the law and issue marriage certificates to, to people. So we already have that going on with, uh, with other religions. But just to target the Muslims at this period of time, I, be, I believe, is just stirring up. Well, uh, you know. look, it, it's, it's like I, I, I take your point certainly about um, really fundamentalist Christianity. You know, they, mm -hmm. don't, they do not like homosexuality, but it's slightly different with Islam than it is <coughs> with Christianity in the fact that um, Christianity, and I, I don't agree with this viewpoint, but sees homosexuality as uh, immoral behavior. So it's behavior that you choose to engage in and that you can choose to change. And they believe that if you don't repent, then the punishment will be in the afterlife. The Quran, um, well, Islam is slightly different in they believe all of that, but they believe that they can exact punishment on earth as well as in heaven, which is why there are so many Muslim countries where homosexuality is not only illegal, but punishment by death. Um, and if you look at, even in Australia, I mean, it's interesting the point you raised in, about how apparently in America, you know, Muslims are more accepting of LGBT people than, than Christians. In Australia, a couple of years ago, we had a, a plebiscite to a postal vote on whether same-sex marriage should be legalized. And um, it was a non-compulsory, but about 87% of the population voted, so it was quite a large sample, and it won by about 61%. So a reasonable majority, but not a huge majority, and it came out when we had the electorates who voted yes and no, the toughest no voting elections were all <coughs> labor voters, but they were really immigrant heavy and largely Muslim populated. So while um, the kind of popular zeitgeist in the Australian media, which is very, very kind of regressive left wing, demonizes white people and it demonizes Christians, it was the white Christians actually who voted in same sex marriage in Australia. So yeah, it is. I, I, I take your point totally about Christians and homosexuality, but Islam does take it one step further. Right, and I think we're being a little bit Eurocentric in our terminology here when we're talking about is it okay to be gay? As if it's is it okay to put your elbows on the dinner table? In other parts of the world, they're asking, should you be killed for being gay? Yeah. There is a huge difference there. So the poll you referenced in, in America, you know, is it okay to be gay? Let's ask Christians versus Muslims. Obviously, they're you know Christians are still going to say no. I would love to see. The, the polling like they've done in the UK is that should it be illegal to be gay? And this is what we're talking about. This is what people are so concerned about. Um, because, you know, there there's totally evangelical fundamentalists in the United States. Exactly. But no, sorry. no, no, I'm sorry. I'm just, um, I saw his hand go up. There's, there, there, there's a big difference here that I think maybe we're not grasping it in its entirety because we are blessed enough to have lived in places where it's not, like, of course you're not going to be killed for being gay. It doesn't, it doesn't even register right. for some of us. Uh, Mike, but last for, word. For other people, it's, say, it's I, a big I don't, I don't think that being killed for being gay should be the bar that right. we're putting things out. I would actually and love it to I be mean, have we heard of the right. Pulse right. nightclub? Was, was that a Muslim? Yeah, or that was a, that was yeah actually, yeah, that was a Muslim. Uh, yeah. uh, it was a Muslim? Yes, it was. Oh, okay. What wonderful way to move on to the next question. That was a Muslim? Yes, it was. I was going to say is like, all right. My, my mistake. Guys, guys, guys. If you're gonna be like, okay, Muslims can't come here because they're against LGBTQ, sorry, you're full of shit because the Trump Right, exactly. But again, like, is he trying to be so gay? So so okay. like, look, we discriminate against uh, gay people. Like, I mean, I'm just looking at the thing now which says the Trump administration um, allowed a bill to go through that allows for discrimination against gay people in the workplace. That's, that's, that's shit. That's bullshit. Okay, he's okay, also, next question. Also, next question. Right. Right. Next about, question, he's guys. Also, he's also launching a, um, an initiative around the world to actually decriminalize homosexuality in countries where... So, he, so Trump, we found he our also next... also had an amazing, you know, Trump steaks were amazing and juicy, but, you know... So we found uh, our next panel topic that we're going to have next year, guys. Uh, and, All right. and uh, Trump University guys, would make you a successful business. Next question better be about Trump steaks. Let's right. go. I mean, really, it's like he, it's a, he's a con man. Okay, I lived I, in New I York think my whole got, life. We've got a question, we question coming next. Let's right. this Thank you guys, first of all, for coming out here. Um, on the left, we hear a lot of talk about exploitation. On the right, we hear a lot of talk about, well, we want only the best and brightest immigrants coming here. How is it not a form of exploitation 
to strip these countries of their best and brightest, leading to a cascade making things worse at home? And is it not the soft bigotry of low expectations that we scapegoat the United States instead of holding them to be moral actors, fixing their own problems at home? Okay. I mean, um, I think you're absolutely right. It is completely a brain drain to say everybody who's smart and talented just come to America or Canada, but that's why we need immigration limits, right? Even when we're saying let's take the best and brightest, there still needs to be limits that respond to the marketplaces and the demands of the individual economy. Canada for a long time has had an amazing point system similar to Australia, and it was great. For a long time, the average immigrant was better educated than a native Canadian, which is perfect. But in places like Vancouver and Toronto, we still see the problem of these enclaves forming and a lack of assimilation because there were just too many immigrants even though they were great and qualified. So it, it's not just, you, you still need to have limits even if we're saying that there's gonna be merit-based immigration. And, and, and that way as well, it doesn't completely drain these other economies of their, you know, their doctors, their economists, their lawyers and everything. I don't see that, um, that someone coming to a country and not being highly educated is necessarily a bad exactly. thing. Because I mean, <coughs> they can come to the country and then get educated. I mean, it's nothing stopping a person who doesn't have the <coughs> facilities back in their own country for whatever reason to come to um, a, a country like America or New Zealand and get a proper education. I mean, it's a bad thing if you're a native person who wants that spot, who well, doesn't yeah. have skills, but who has to compete in that I market. Mean, okay, so we're not doing anything to, to fix the problem of there being no education for Americans right. as well. Right. So well, just do both, right? It's not yeah, let's do both. Do Bring in some people, give them education, well, well, give, give all the people education. That's what I'm not? about. I mean, the... I mean, it's not yep. free. We'll take the money from friggin' George Bezos. Uh, free. No, but I mean, with, uh, if George the Bezos immigrants is brother. who yeah. we have st have <coughs> statistics on immigration, that the people, the low-skilled immigrants come to the United States. They add more. They pay more taxes into our economy than they get out mm. in services. So uh, it's uh, and then it doubles for the uh, those with education. So it's not like. They're not contributing to, well, the, to the economy. I mean, the Heritage the Foundation the has had conflicting studies. And one of their reports said that every immigrant we accept without a high school education actually ends up costing, I think it's upwards of 100000 I don't know the well, exact Well, I'd like to see And also, stats, um, when we're I talking about specifically, are they claiming welfare? That's one part of it. But you have to look at, in all Western economies, the people who are most likely to be unemployed the, the most vulnerable parts of our populations are the populations who are less skilled. Is it a good idea to bring in more people to compete for those jobs when even the people here well, don't have fine. access then to those we jobs? We should prosecute the employers who I'm hire them that that instead too. of taking people out of, you know, chicken but even, factories. But even if we bring them in legally, they're still competing for those jobs that, because of automation, are getting fewer and fewer. It, it's causing we, an uh, imbalance in the market. How about we value, uh, you know, different sorts of uh, vocation more so that those uh, become more desirable jobs for other people, you know? Right. So like, um, if we, we place a higher value on educators, on uh, medical professionals, you know, there's people who do these uh, jobs that greatly benefit society, that don't really get, you know, money for it. I mean, in New Zealand, we've had for, for a very long time, um, you know, strikes from, from nurses and, uh, and educators for, for, for the longest time because we don't pay them enough. These people uh, uh, educate our next generation or, you know, fix your broken leg and we don't pay them enough. So, you know, wh where's the incentive to get into that sort of vocation? Um, well, the, the, the thing is though, like, um, like, you're like, you make a good point there, but what, what is, is value and should, you know, this, this sort of abstract concept of value actually dictate what people are paid, and we, we had an inter we have a very interesting labor politician called Tanya Plibersek in Australia, and she astounded us all um, a little while ago about making a, a speech in Parliament about early childhood educators and metal workers, and early childhood educators. It's something like 96% female, like it's a really heavily female-dominated industry. And of course, metal workers are is largely male-dominated. And she said that the reason that metal workers got paid $40 an hour and early childcare educators got paid $20 an hour was because 
uh, it was an example of gender-based discrimination because early childcare work was uh, predominantly female. What she neglected um, to mention, by the way, I have utmost respect for anyone who works in early childcare. Like, I've nannied, like, you know, I can't <laughs> imagine doing that continually. Um, what she neglected to mention was how dangerous it is to be a metal worker, what long hours you have to work, you're handling hot metal, you're working on building bridges, you're working on oil rigs, you risk death, dismemberment, injury, all sorts of things. You've got incredibly expensive tools to pay for, upfront expenses, you've got to pay for vehicles, expensive vehicles to transport those tools, all of which is eventually a tax deduction, but upfront it's a lot of money. And the degree, even though they're both three or four year degrees in Australia, the metalwork degree actually costs more than the early childhood education degree. So yeah, we need to value nurses and we need, you know, but there are other things there to consider in these different professions. It's not to do with gender, it's to do with what's required. Yeah, so why don't we, you know, uh, if we're talking about the, I mean- Last word, Mike. <laughs> not gonna happen. It, the, no, um, clear white privilege, you get the last word. <laughs> <laughs> I have a ginger. There is that no is privilege in being a ginger. You're an oppressed minority. I am a free oppressed minority. You are. Jesus Christ, you go to high school as a ginger. Fuck Male privilege, whatever. Um, uh, Non-binary. Um, the, um, like, being, okay, first of all, being a childhood educator, I mean, again, you're educating the next generation of children. I mean, we should be placing a huge amount of value on that. I mean, you can talk about the dangerousness of a job and that being uh, a factor that it, uh, adds into it as well, and that's fine, but, uh, I mean, what about like you know the long hours that teachers stay up you know uh, planning all their planning their lessons and things like that the, the all these all the other sorts of things that aren't necessarily just like physical manliness that you know that factor into the to the I mean quote unquote risks of being a a, a teacher I mean the fact that you don't get paid enough um, that's that's like a that's a risk in of itself you can't afford to you know have food you can't you couldn't afford to have a child any of that sort of stuff. I mean, these are other things that are gonna f add into the, the reason why we should be paying these people more. A very valid point. Children are a s drain on a family. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, thank you so much. And thank you everyone, everyone. <laughs> Next conference, we're gonna have Mike singing. Everyone on stage has a platform. Everyone on stage is subscribable too. You should definitely check every single person out here. Speaking as an immigrant, I disagree with everyone. <laughs> they all got it wrong. It's much harder than they say. You all now have five minutes to take care of your business, but before you do, let's give everyone a huge round of applause. And we're back here in five, less, because we took too much time, in three minutes for the not safe for work, or as I call it, the sex panel. So get back here. <laughs>